Hello, welcome back to SolarWinds Lab. So glad to see you back again. And this episode's gonna be a little bit different because we're gonna do something new. Like actually get out of the studio and shoot live at a conference. Not just any conference, but Amazon's AWS reInvent. Some say it's the largest event of its kind held by the largest single infrastructure provider on Earth. Okay, first, Tom says that, while also talking about how fast Microsoft Azure is growing. And second, our surveys in the live chat from uh, Thwack Camp 2018 say that maybe a quarter of IT is actually on cloud. Yeah, so there's just a little bit of hype. A little hype, and I'm the first one to admit that underneath the buzzword monolith, there's actually valuable stuff there. Huh? DevOps. Ah, buzzword monolith. I, I like what you did there. I mean, it's meta, but not actually GNU. Okay, it's not anything like GNU, and no one is trying to shame you if you're not all in on GNU. You know, that's actually kind of true, right? Like, there's a lot of people that are trying to tell you that you really just don't count if you're not, like, full DevOps. Right, and the point is more about understanding observability than setting up a Kanban board. How can you say that DevOps is hype and then invoke observability? Because one of them is unicorn farts and the other one is actual monitoring. So that's what this episode is going to be about? We're going to do DevOps versus IT ops versus unicorn farts versus monitoring? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, see, you and Tom are going to toddle off to Las Vegas, you talk to our customers and actual people doing actual IT things, and see if we're really that far behind. Piece of cake. But then you have to come back here, and then we take what they're doing, how they actually are using a subset of DevOps tools alongside the main dashboards for keeping their infrastructure online. Ah, so DevOps for the rest of ops. Yes, it's FestivOps. Well, it's the season. Right. It, you know what we ought to do? Okay, so let's get real first. You go to AWS and ask actual admins, not the cool kids, if they're actually doing DevOps. All right, then what are you going to do? I'm going to wait right here because I did booth duty last year. And then when you come back, you can admit what we already know. So then whatever I come back with, uh, you're going to show them how it's used in the real world by real admins using SolarWinds products. Yep. All right. But first, we really ought to talk about what DevOps is and isn't. I mean, we made the joke before that it is pretty overloaded with hype. So let's yes. start with how do we get to this place where once upon a time it was a great idea and now it's really confusing? I, 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 like most things, it got caught up in the buzzword bingo and a few executives got really excited about it and they wanted to buy a box of DevOps and sprinkle it all over everything. Right. It's just not that anymore. It's, yeah, it, it never it, was that. It's that age old story and I hate to use OpenFlow as, as an example, <laughs> right? But I mean, it, it was a, uh, the idea of technology that started with us, it started with geeks, it started mm -hmm. with people who were actually applying technology in the field. And they wanted some, some enlightened developers mm -hmm. and some enlightened and eager operations professionals got together and say, hey, I think we can collaborate and do something cool here. And to your point, yeah, then vendors jumped on it and made it into this thing of, hey, if you buy these products with these check boxes, then ta-da! You're doing DevOps. You're doing DevOps. Yay. Yeah, no, and we used to have a, a word for it, a very technical word. It was called teamwork. Okay, so the terminology is a little bit different. When we talk about tooling, they tend to kind of fall into three categories, right? Right. So there's metrics, mm -hmm. there's uh, logging, logging, and tracing. And tracing, right. And then sometimes you can talk about sort of user experience too is sort of that, that fourth thing. But when you hear people talk about the three pillars of observability, mm -hmm. those are the three things that they'll talk about. And it's interesting that one of the things that we talk about is, is we say metrics, not monitoring. So how are they different? So metrics can come from anywhere. Right. Monitoring is typically used to refer to poll-based. I realize that we're getting really pedantic about that. Mm. Like, oh, that word doesn't mean that thing. It means whatever, I mean, like, just use words, right? But understand that when you're talking to somebody who's really deep in the DevOps culture and perhaps fanboying a little bit, that metrics has a particular connotation right now. Right, well, and the other thing, that too, that you mentioned there is, data from wherever. And I think when you hear people talk about the word observability, and you know, we did make a joke about it, but observability really is also a way of kind of thinking about it differently, a refresh view, because for so long, products have been really mature. If I point something that is designed to monitor DB2, mm -hmm. it is going to light up a dashboard with everything that I need for that database instance. I mean, right. it's not going to tell me about sort of query level uh, performance tuning, but in terms of the platform itself, yeah. or Exchange, or any number of applications, the infrastructure itself, certainly on the networking side, or virtualization management platforms, monitoring is great at going out, and when we say the word monitoring, mm -hmm. we're thinking about a thing that you turn on and it pulls all that data in. Right. But it's not necessarily things like, hey, can you light up a dashboard out of log data? 
Yeah, and, and I call it the not me line. For a long time in at least my career as a monitoring engineer, there was this not, the, in, in my head I had this not me line. Okay, so me was that monitoring, collecting data from all sorts of sources using all sorts of interesting techniques and stuff. But when someone said log file aggregation, that was in the not me territory. And when they said tracing, it's like, oh, the, the coders, the programmers, they care about tracing. That's, in the, that's across the not me line. And the not me line now has moved so that observability now includes those things to create a whole coherent cohesive view of everything through the stack from top to bottom but you're just able to accommodate a wider range of uh, data sources and it's interesting that you call it that I kind of re refer to that same line as the fast versus meticulous line right so what I mean by that is how quickly do I need data and how quickly am I willing to create access to those metrics and then dispose of them so for example if I am monitoring an on-prem application that is going to run for years not mm -hmm. for 15 seconds or <laughs> five minutes or however long that process is going to run right. I will invest some time to make sure that I can set up from an observability perspective, uh, a set of monitoring poll-based metrics that are super comprehensive, and then I make sure that thing is running every day. I right. don't make a lot of changes to it. I may add a few metrics here or there, and I may adjust my dashboards, and hopefully you are all spending a ton of time adjusting your alerts, because yes. too many alerts is not the policy of SolarWinds. Let's say that again. It is right. not the policy of SolarWinds. If you have not seen what, any alerts? <laughs> alerts, how do I hate how thee I hate from Black Camp right? this year, or right. any number of probably six other episodes. Please go back we'll in the back catalog. We'll have all of them in the show notes, trust me. Yeah, and just lab.solowins.com, look at, expand that page, and search on alerts, and you'll see a whole bunch of them all pop up. Mm -hmm. But the other thing with DevOps is I tend to think of how quickly can I get metrics data? Because I'm going to start with a bench test, right? Because a lot of times, especially if I'm redesigning an application, what, not even forget something that's brand new, but I'm taking an existing application, I have robust monitoring, mm -hmm. now all of a sudden I have little to no monitoring, how quickly can I, in my initial tests, achieve parity with what I had before, but then once it's deployed into a the unknown abyss of ops, again, if we sort of want to, you know, we ought to do, let's take, Let's take a couple of roles here, right? And it's a little bit of a gag, you know, that, that I sort of play this overly excited, uh, develop, automation-focused uh, engineer. It's a gag? I thought it was like, that's... <clears throat> Once upon a time, <laughs> a very long time ago, but listen, I, I, I know a thing or two about ops. Sure. And then, of course, you, you are always the voice of the sage, dependable, quality-focused engineer who's thinking about keeping the lights on an application seven years after op, uh, the dev team hands it over to ops, right? right. But when we go back to what we were talking about before about, you know, where did DevOps come from and the original intent, mm -hmm. so much of it was collaborative, right? right? And it was almost inviting. It, as opposed to, you know, I, so much of that adversarial communication that you hear on teams about, I don't want to do DevOps, or it's just too hard, or this is a massive culture change, or we don't have a budget for that, or all the things that, 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 are, that are part of that. I, I hate to play, I hate to invoke the back in the day, but back in the day, we just worked to get it out the door, right? right? And, and it was it was about inviting uh, collaboration. So, uh -huh. for example, operations said to developers, "Hey, you have some tools that could allow us to actually have more time on the weekends without our pagers." Right. Because back then it was pagers, right? Right. And then a lot of times for um, developers, operations said, "Hey, you know what you need to improve the quality of uh, service over time? You need a feedback loop where we're going to take." actual real data mm -hmm. coming from real operations and constantly feed that back into the development process. Well, there's also, and again, this, this wasn't any sort of movement or whatever. It just sort of happened naturally in healthy organ organizations, I almost said healthy organisms, which is almost the same, that the developers would work with the operations folks and say, how do, you know, how do we help each other? Oh, you know what? This operation stuff, keeping the system up, I can do things to affect that. I can do things to make it better. This operation stuff isn't so bad. Like you said, you started as a dev, but you found that operations was maybe hard, but not impossible and not incomprehensible. And then the, uh, the operations folks looked at what the devs were doing and Maybe didn't say, oh, I want to code a multi-tier, you know, library-infused thing, but they developed a, a sense of code. They developed an appreciation for what was happening and say, you know what, some of these techniques I can use and I can be aware of. And, and that is, I think, at the heart of DevOps even before it got a, a, a name or the Phoenix Project came out in print or whatever it is. So, interesting you mentioned that. So, where do you think that... 
where did it become a problem? Where did people suddenly become fearful of it? Instead of just saying, oh, these are just some additional tools that we would use in particular circumstances. When it became a thing, trademark, registered, all rights reserved. Like so, when it became like DevOps, then that's when people started to like, I, you know, I don't need another SOA in my life. Okay, enough of that. It's time for you to get over to AWS, and we'll find out if you really know what you're talking about. Awesome. Do I get to use the door? No. No door for you. Welcome to reInvent, and welcome, Patrick, for finally getting here. Leon didn't let me use the door. It's a, it's a transporter. The door is a magical place, it, and it's also a good place to have a nap. That's actually really true. So why are we here? We're here, I'll tell you why we're here. Not just us, but everybody in general. Three things, right? Three things I've noticed. Uh, one, people want metrics. They want data. They want the ability to, and this is two, the ability to log all of those metrics. Right. Right. And then three, they want to do analysis on the logs that have those metrics. You know what I call that? Uh, let me guess. What? Uh, observability. Observability. And observability is one of those terms from uh, that thing that people like to believe in, that sorcery called DevOps. DevOps, yes. And so DevOps is a thing, right? You can buy that? Yeah, sure. I buy DevOps off the shelf at my grocery store. Mm -hmm. Don't you? It's not marketing at all. It's not overloaded. It is totally a marketing term for something that has existed probably throughout human history. DevOps really isn't a thing. It's more of a process. It's more of a process. Well, and especially, I mean, like our shirts, right? You know, more dev, less up. The, it's, it's interesting the way I've had so many comments on the shirt, and everyone seems to be taking it the same way, which is basically automation is good. It's been good for 5,000 years. The wheel was good. Steam was good. I never thought of the wheel as automation, but sure. Okay, but electricity was good, right? The idea of uh, robots are good. The idea of being automation illuminate, uh, eliminates drudgery yeah. and toil, and that is the whole point of what DevOps is supposed to be about. It's not eliminating operations, it's getting rid of the drudgery so that you can focus on actually making a difference and accomplishing your goals. Okay, so this is a DevOps show then. Mm, it's a developer show, maybe, kind of, no. What do you think? Is it a cloud show? Sort of. Sort of, You're yeah. getting closer, what yeah. do you think? I think what you're looking at is the world's largest infrastructure conference. Think about everything that you have here. You have people who, and it's all about the data. Right. So you have people and companies here focus on the storage of your data, the migration of your data, the ability to report on that data, mm -hmm. the high availability, disaster transformation. recovery, transformation, everything you need to do, and of course all the JSON, like, JSON's everywhere. Well you included JSON, so we're now JSON compliant. But, but all that data is hosted in AWS. They are providing the infrastructure. They are on track to become essentially the world's largest MSP. That's true, because what do MSPs do? Uh, they back up your data. They, right, they restore your data when you need it. They, help, they give you tools to solve problems, performance insights. They help you with analytics. Um, what else? Mm, well, some of them will you know, reset your printer, but I mean, for the most part, well, it sounds like what you're really saying though, or maybe I'll take a huge jump. All right. Is does it mean that cloud is essentially data as infrastructure and that all the rest of this is just plumbing and tools that enables that? Wow, data as infrastructure. Like, to, it's not thinking about the physicality of infrastructure. It's not servers and chassis. It's really distilling it back down to the thing that actually matters, which is your data. Right, and what company would want your data more than, say, Amazon? Uh, maybe Microsoft. Mm. These are the companies that want your data because if they have your data, they have your business, right? That's absolutely right. And that's why we're here. Yeah, well, it is kind of interesting too because I mean, DevOps is obviously an overloaded term. Yep. And so much of it, I was thinking about uh, uh, talking to a customer the other day and he was talking about how um, it, there's you know, uh, disagreements between teams and they don't trust each other and maybe they don't get along. And, and he's coming from sort of a traditional on-prem IT environment which is you know, all about cost savings and SLA and the rest of it. And they're, they're being tasked with innovation goals and a lot of other things. And so they're trying to incorporate, they've, they've basically been told to get DevOps by the end of 2019. Right, and you, you don't do that. Yeah. But, so they're trying to pick up best practices, but I was thinking about it, I'm like, and I don't think everything goes back to an Apollo uh, analogy, but 
If you think about the Apollo F1 engine, right, there's that, that myth that they can't rebuild the Saturn V because they lost all of the blueprints, which of course is completely ridiculous. They have, NASA has all of the details of everything about that program, but literally they started, you know, pulled a bunch of uh, F1 engines out of uh, storage to take a look at them for the SLS program with the idea of being thinking, well, maybe we'll do this instead of SRB boosters, right? And the conclusion was we can't build them. And the reason we can't build them is because it's not that we don't have the blueprints, but there was, you know, there was skill, there was special knowledge that the welders and the other engineers who built them had, that there were notes on paper and that they were lost a long time ago, right? So the solution was the new the new kids at NASA went and redesigned a lot of 3D printed technology, were able to dramatically reduce the part count, and basically built a, a design for an engine that you could build now today with today's technology that would eliminate the problem of not having that engine. Right? Yeah. Now bear with me. So I'm in, terms of the, with you. in terms of the skepticism, there are those who might say, if you were a younger engineer at NASA, they would say, oh, all you old timers, you know, you, you, you didn't bother to document your code, right? They effectively didn't keep those notes around and prevented the, us to have the ability to rebuild the engine now. Yeah. But those old timers would say, okay, hold on a second. Um, we managed to send humans to the moon uh, 50 years ago. Where's that engine that you designed? Just show me one of those, right? Get off my lawn. Right. So, so that 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 dichotomy of we have a great idea and we have a great plan, sort of the dev focused, along with engineers and operations, right. who is like, but we actually do it. We actually right. provide the technology and the tools and the services that allow our businesses to continue to operate. So. Does that does that work for you? Because I know that you're works for me. Like that, that. But that's what I meant by saying saying one word: process. It's a process. It's a it's a way for you to essentially do business, to do IT, to do it properly, right. to have teams that are integrated. Now, I'm old enough to remember when we called DevOps synergy, and we just said we need more synergy around here, right? That's the, about the same amount of marketing. <laughs> but those were the words because we just needed the teams to be integrated and to be in sync with each other and to understand that uh, no, you know, what is it that this group needs now or will need in a week from now, and to have people all. You know, at the table, understanding what everybody's doing, right hand, left hand, all that type of stuff, all the same jargon we've heard for years. Right. But DevOps just encap uh, encapsulates all of that. Yep. And it's really about the process. How is your team, how's your company working, efficiently or not? And DevOps is that all. Big, one big word that just sort of describes all of it, to me. Well, that's, you, that's how I take it. Well, do you feel like really it comes down to an opportunity to collaborate based on tools, right? That the idea that there were these two separate camps with wildly different technology. I mean, you look at the adoption of, um, you know, a lot of existing SolarWinds customers who are now monitoring, monitoring a lot of containers, right? That was something they've got, they're, they're dealing with containers in Kubernetes and Mesos, not just like, you know, single standalone Docker instances, that was going to be DevOps. That was going to be these special new teams, and instead Instead, it's a commodity technology, and anything that's commodity immediately is about cost savings, which pushes it into traditional IT, and it ends up being business challenges that need to be solved, and the tools that address them. So I feel like there's an opportunity for dev and ops to really focus on collaborating on tools, right? If I need to drive a nail, I'm thinking about the hammer. If I'm digging a hole, it's about using a shovel. It's like, it's not so much that there's this great philosophy that has to be adopted. And I'm not, I'm not discounting Agile, and I'm not absolutely not discounting the need to really think about culture change, really to instill the idea of feedback loops is something that takes a, a lot of effort from both sides. Developers to make sure that they're baking monitoring and metrics into applications before deployment to make it easier for ops, but then ops committing to make sure that they're sending those metrics back into the development process to improve quality over time. Okay. But I mean, is it ultimately like, it might be the tools that you use and com common tools that work for both groups, it's supposed to me. But the tools you're talking about is just something that help with a part of the process. So for example, containers are a great way to to do test-driven development. It's, it's like the way to do test-driven development, right. right? But that's just a thing you would have already been doing that just took you forever and containers just make it a little bit easier. So it's not, it, is it part tools? I, I guess you could say that, but you know what it really is? To me, it's about if you're going to be data-driven or not. Mm. Are you truly going to be data-driven? Are you going to do things and you're going to let the data dictate and help drive decisions? Or are you still going to operate on a hunch? Right, you're going to spin up all these containers. You're going to do a deployment, and let's say, let's say you do something, uh, you do, um, you deploy something ten times, it succeeds seven, seven out of ten times, it failed right. three times. Um, is that a success? 
Okay, but now you're getting into like error rate metrics and error yeah, budgets no, no, no. and sort of things. What I'm getting into is actually, if it's something being pushed to every desktop, would you want 30% of all desktops to have a failure and be calling IT? As long as it's only the executive desktop upgrades that fail, I, I don't think you'd have a problem. Right, so here's the thing. You would look at somebody and say, no, no, we need like something closer to 100% success rate. This is something user experience. But if the guy in charge of IT says, ah, I got a feeling we'll be okay. Let's just go ahead on Friday and deploy this. So it's part tools, but it's also part being a data-driven culture. And I think that's a huge part of DevOps in general is all these different teams have their own area of focus and it's all about their parts of their data. And are they truly letting the data help them make better decisions? Well, but isn't that part of the misdirection around AI and ML? I mean, the whole idea about, you're talking about bias, right? Yeah. Decision bias, conclusion bias. Yeah. So you're saying data will help eliminate human bias. So we're being told that, oh no, AI and ML are the only way to get past that, but really, those are both completely dependent on data analysis. So, oh. right? Data and humans. Humans to write the code. Humans and data. So, so you're basically you're saying that one of the primary goals for anyone, regardless of how they come to operations, whether they're cloud-focused or they're on-prem, is to really start admitting that they might have everything that they need in the data that they're already responsible for, and to start looking to the data and to not go just based on hunch. Right. I mean, like, one of the ones that, that I think is absolutely true, and especially talking to customers here, is how often do we think, like, what are the top 10 problems in your infrastructure? And now you could, you immediately are say, I can list the systems, I can list the people, resources, whatever else, budget. Yeah. But if you looked at the data, would it really be those 10? Would it maybe be 10 other ones that you didn't even think no, about? my first would be the data itself. That would be number one, the data. Data's never right. Da data's never right? I didn't go to school to become a data janitor, it just sort of happened. Nobody goes to school to be a data janitor, but yet we end up, how much, how much data janitorial services have you done over the years? Oh, I'd probably say, what, 85, 90% of touching data has been janitorial. Exactly, exactly. That's where everybody spends the bulk of their time. Mm. So one of the things I like is this is actually the second year that Lab has been able to come to AWS, right? Yes. And so what are we doing here this year? Well, what we have to do is we have to work. Not just our booth, but we need to walk the floor and we need to figure out, you know, what are the challenges people have? What are the solutions on the floor here that are talk, meant to help talk to, people? Talk to you guys. We have to talk to you guys. So I mean, we've got some work to do. That's what we're doing here. All right, so we're going to have a little fun. We're going to go by the booth, talk to a couple of customers. Uh, there's no fun here. There's no fun at reInvent. No. This is a serious. No, no fun at all. This, this is, is a not serious a, business, there's Patrick. No, there's no boondoggle right. at, at all. We're working hard. So welcome to the booth, and you seem to have survived your date with the uh, unicorn. So you promised me to, it was a unicorn, but it turned out to be Robo Kitty, and I rode Robo Kitty like a boss. And now you're sitting in a chair for some reason. Yes, I'm sitting uh, for no related reason whatsoever. Mm, 
Yeah, well, so hey, let's talk about what it's like here in this booth, because it's a little bit different at this show than maybe where we normally see you at Cisco Live or uh, Microsoft Ignite or maybe VMworld. RSA or VMworld, yep. yep. Or at, certainly at a swug. Yeah. But uh, yeah, the conversations here are a little bit different. And we just had one that was, I think, the best one of the show. Absolutely. Not just because it came from a, a really unexpected place, but the, the spirit of what he was saying really, to me, captured what DevOps is all about. So this is a DBA yes. who is talking about using tools and some new techniques to really bring uh, uh, the ops team, uh, the, the dev team, into operations, right? So what were the two things, what, what, what was driving that for him? Well, uh, I remember the statement he said that he had a goal of wanting to get uh, the tools, the right tools to them that they would want to use. Right. Instead of forcing a tool on them and say, you know, this is the direction, this is where we're going to go. He goes, no, no, let's figure out what it is they, they want and need right. and give it to them. Because it, because then they would adopt it yes. and feel invited. So what right. I loved about it was his, his spirit, you know, you talk about the culture change of DevOps, was inviting those teams in and instead of it being developers pushing themselves onto, I, onto ops, which never right. works, right. it was someone in ops, and you know, there's a little bit of a reputation among database administrators as being a little focused Salty. on their, oh, or that. But here's someone that literally from the inside of the inside of the onion, yes. right, is the one who's reaching out, pulling team members in, and he was doing it for, for there was a couple reasons. So there was that, it was helping, he was using the tools selection as the, the grease to make that happen. Right. But he was doing it because one, it made his job easier to get those teams involved but also he was acting as a force multiplier because he knew the data. He's the database person, to your point before about it is data as infrastructure, but he's using his knowledge of the data to then, and the importance of data, to get them to collaborate around a database, a, the core of what is traditional operations, to really improve the, the, the delivery of services to his organization. It was amazing, and I'm, I'm hoping that we can uh, bring maybe more conversations from him in the future, but that, he, he really was was that spirit of what DevOps really is about. It's, it's using development to streamline operations, not replace operations, but to get the ugly stuff out of the way so that you can really focus on doing what you need to do. That's right, drive the business. Driving the business. Yeah. So uh, real quick, we just want to show you a couple things where there is a difference in some of the conversations that we had about what, if, you are a, uh, if you're a DevOps team or certainly a developer, you're thinking about, and certainly if you're operating in the cloud, how the, the uh, views that you use among the tools are a little bit difference. So let me show you just a couple of them real quick. Okay, so first of all, dashboards, we live and die by our dashboards. Dashboards are a little bit different when you're at cloud scale, right? And it's a combination of infrastructure and events and a whole lot of other stuff that, you know, don't necessarily go together. It's basically uh, apples and oranges for days, right, at enormous scale. So, so for example, here's a dashboard. This is a, this is a, a Slingbot production dashboard. So this is things like API submissions, uh, consumer messages. Here we got a, a fetcher job process. You know, these are specific to a application that is a cloud native application. But right. It's got some other resources that actually span into hybrid, right? So when you look at the sorts of uh, elements, just the diversity of data that are coming from that are a part of the dashboards that you're using are they're not focused sort of at that host uh, level or this is a VM or this is a network interface. It's a combination of all of them. That's right. right. So the second thing that happens a lot is you normally start thinking about services a little bit differently, right? You don't necessarily know where they're running. You don't have as much of a deterministic view to be able to say, yes, I know all the elements of this app. So what ends up happening is um, host definition becomes a little different. View, like am, is a host the physical host or is it containers that are running on that host? And then the other thing too is you end up with a different view of infrastructure in terms of problems, right? Like heat maps of problems. Like here we're looking at a lot of hot trace data where this is based on a lot of error reporting, right? So almost that definition of infrastructure can change by the minute. It's not, this is my core network and then these are the services that support applications and virtualization. Instead it's where are we in the moment and you start your drill down sort of from the problem view. Okay. Right? 
The other thing that's a little bit different is troubleshooting is really different, right? Especially like here's an application, uh, this is like a, a booking service, right? So this is a horizontally scaled application. There's the front end app and then the main contributor is this database behind it. But in this case, I don't know where they are and they change hosts from minute to minute. So this is where tracing comes in. And that's something that is really new if you're uh, used to working more with uh, traditional uh, IT processes and on-prem. Um, and so for them, they start looking at uh, queries, and it becomes more about outliers, right? So in this case, these are transactions that are flowing through the system. And so I started looking for things in this heat map, like, well, what's going on here? What is, what is this What is this one problem in this transaction? So this is a call to a booking service. I'm going to click on that call, and you start thinking instead about all the different layers. So this is an app that's built out of MongoDB, Spring, it's a Java-based application, uh, Faraday, and it runs on Rails, and you end up drilling into calls. So it ends up being more, to your point, about databases that would typically be, am I optimizing this query? More, how many times does that query run? So optimization around data is a little bit different. And when you start looking at what's going on in a database, being able to drill in and do where uh, tracing normally would be, you're looking at the queries that are coming back as a part of, let's say, database performance analyzer. In this case, the trace itself is, is where you're getting the details that were part of, in this case, the database lookup, or maybe it's the URL parameters that are coming through the front end, or it's uh, part of a, a memcache or um, uh, other uh, uh, memory uh, caching service, watching the steps step to step to try to figure out what's driving those weird outliers at high volume. And nothing you've shown here right now says to me host or server or instance of a database. It's, right. just, it's just showing the layers of you know the function, the call, because that's all you care about. The infrastructure is provided by somebody else. Right. So you don't care about that infrastructure anymore. And they right? won't let you care anymore. Yeah, they won't let you care either. Right. You, you can't care. It's parts flying information. Right. But in all of these cases, when we're talking to customers who are having a great experience, who will say, yes, we're, we're doing DevOps, they are, going back to the conversation a second ago, it is where they are collaborating on the tool selection so that they both enjoy that experience, they have a common uh, vocabulary about being able to look at telemetry data yes. across applications, right? So it, it, everyone benefits from that. The other thing that's different is there's also kind of different users. Like if you're a marketing person, if you care about like an external website that's being hosted um, in cloud, for example, or especially when it's pushed out to edge and there's a whole bunch of of uh, local optimization to reduce latency. Being able to look at that from like a, a meta level for the web app is a lot of people are Pingdom customers here. I think I know a lot of you are using Pingdom. What's interesting is that if you're thinking about this a little bit more about development, that next step is not, hey, I'm the, the uh, CMO, is my app web, it's what's the experience? Like, are API calls performing as well as my users are experiencing on their mobile devices? So right. a lot of granularity there to be able to figure out how that's working, and things like, well, you know, what's the, what's the experience by site? Oh, what is this? It's just my blog. It's your blog. Well, how's your blog doing? I, you know what? I have a page speed score of 81, and is that good? So you're a B minus. I'm a B minus, and I could get better. Well, why do you have a? Why do you have a? Part of the reason here is I can see that the uh, header page is fairly large files. Your One, wife takes fantastic pictures. It's of a you. beautiful photo. It is a fantastic right? photo. But it's too big. It's too big, so what are you going to do? So I got to have her give me something at a slightly lower resolution. I got to reduce that file size. But for me, I mean, this is the stuff you care about for the end user experience. Now, it only took a couple of seconds to load the page, but half that time was just loading that image. And for me, and living in the US, I can deal with that. I don't think it's a problem. But you know what? Some countries don't have the best networks. Okay, but hosting, hosting this page, you're ops for yourself for this That's site, right? right? But if you are taking it down to the level of caring about how am I going to fix this problem, you're a developer now. That's you're right. You're doing HTML, Himital, and yes. you're now talking about optimizing that image, one of the assets for it, or maybe using a... a, a I could use a CDN in order to get CDN, there faster too. Yeah. But now you're thinking like a developer. Yes. So again, it's that bridge between improving quality of service requires a thinking about it more to kind of a component level or the discrete That's data right. that it takes to fix that. Yeah. So again, data-driven, right? Data-driven. Data the size of that file. Purely data-driven. I know what to work on now. 
next? The data tells me what to do. Uh, the next thing, of course, logs are really important. And yes. one of the things that you were telling us over and over again, and folks that we've talked to here is, oh, no, 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 there's nothing to pull. Yeah. There is no infrastructure except giant fire hoses of logs that get spit at me that contain the data that I need dashboards made out of. This has been the most popular thing I've talked about uh, this week. Everybody has they, they metrics, they want logs of metrics, and they want to do analytics of the logs of those metrics. Imagine a knock view made of nothing but log-based data. That, data. That would be cool. So, they'll use views here like this is data coming out of uh, CloudTrail that's pulled together into what would look like a traditional dashboard. Beyond that, you'll start to do things like, you know, a lot of them, that first dev step is, well, how do I derive data from that? Because it's not, maybe it's JSON and it's ready to go. Maybe it's an unformatted data type or it's XML or it's something else. So one of the things that they'll spend a lot of time doing is actually creating derived fields from that data that they can take action on. Down here, like automatically created tags so multi-dimensional tagging becomes a big part of what you're doing. Like, hey, I want to know all of my uh, front end uh, issues or errors that are coming regardless of the system. So there's a little bit more regex, there's a little bit more definition that's a part of that, but the tools are discovery tools in a slightly different way. Like, is regex dev? Oh, regex is just, I, I, there are words I would use to describe regex. <laughs> Words that we can't say on SolarWinds Lab. Uh, I'm not sure I would classify it as dev, but then again, I'm not sure I wouldn't. It's, right. hard, it's hard to say. All right, well, and then the last thing that they're definitely talking about is the need to be able to grab logs wherever they may be. That's right. Absolutely. Right, if you have things, a container that only runs for five minutes, it has a terrible error that you needed to catch. Yes. Uh, but be, but also to be able to look at things like log volume, log rate. Uh, the, the live the, tail. The number of people who are using Paper Trail is just delightful. And there is a free tier, by the way, so if you want to play with this or you're kind of a Raspberry Pi now, Arduino, I'm doing more Arduino stuff these days. Uh, if you, being able to capture the events that are coming out of devices, wherever they are is a big part of what operations cares about. And so uh, going back again to that conversation of being collaborative, sort of the spirit of what DevOps actually can be to get beyond the marketing hype, being able as operations to specify, to say, hey, here's a line of code. If you would please drop that into this application or here's, here's the logging definition that should be a part of a container uh, definition so that it automatically is going to, as the orchestrator scales it up or my deployment Clean stock is going to deploy that. It's automatically going to ship my logs off to a to the SaaS endpoint and figure out what to do with that, so that I in operations can sort it out later. Again, it's a chance to get past that. I've been waiting on Dev for a week. This thing keeps failing, and it's on me to deal with the the heat from executives. Again, it's that great opportunity to sort of use tools as a common way of of uh, connecting people. So yeah, just magic on toast. Magic, magic is a great word to describe this week, especially for me. So it, I, I don't know if you saw all the keynotes, but it, watch the replays of the keynotes. The keynotes were very heavily focused on data. Yeah. Very much on data. And this is my biggest takeaway uh, for the week. It's, we talked, is this a DevOps show? Is this a cloud show? And no, it's, it's an infrastructure show, but you know what? It's not DevOps, it's data ops. Everything here, everybody, every vendor is all focused on data, one reason or another. For us, we're trying to help people get the right data so they can make better decisions, right? So we have a tool like Logly. That's why people are coming and they're looking at it, they're going, I have logs everywhere. What am I supposed to do with it? Oh, we can fix that for you, right? Right. I, we know what the pain point is, but it's the problems involved. are solvable. Yes, yeah, so whether it's solvable. us or anyone else. And the conversation I've been having with people, it's always been about my this data thing and how do I do this thing? We can help with that. So uh, it has been magical because it's very much focused on data operations. That's what, you know, data ops is a thing. And unicorn magic. And unicorn magic or Robo Kitty magic, whatever we want to call it. So Robo Kitty is still magic. Robo Kitty is magic. So hopefully you notice that the conversations that we're having, that everyone is having here, are really the same thing. There isn't dev, and there isn't ops, and there isn't cloud, and there isn't on-prem. There are delineations that are about data. Uh, all about, about the data. And, but 
beyond that, there are problems to solve, and it's really about the tools that people are choosing and their approach to get started. Yeah, and who's hosting your infrastructure? I mean, we've had a lot of people, they come and they say, what do you offer as a service? I don't want to host this stuff anymore. Right. I, I want you to do all that work for me. I just want the data, I want the analysis on it, and I want to be able to make better decisions. That's why we're here, right? It, it's, and it, we're not here for a cloud show. We're not here for, it's not a DevOps show, it's not a developer conference. You know what the people are here for? It's because of the data. They all have different data needs, and the data has to go from here to there, but it's all about data, it's all about getting access to the right data, getting analytics on that data, in order to help you make truly a data-driven decision in order to have a positive impact on yourself, your team, your business. That's what this event is all about. So it's, a, it's letting the data inform, or the problems based around managing that data inform the selection the tools that you're using and the approaches that you take. Absolutely. And you know, this has been fun. I really appreciate you having me on Lab. I always enjoy coming out to Lab, but uh, I got a unicorn to tame, and you know what? I heard unicorn bacon is kind of tasty. So. Welcome back. Right? Wasn't that cool? It was. It was. So what? What I think we saw was that people were, I mean, there was a lot of the buzzwords and stuff like that, but they really wanted- A lot wanted, of buzzwords. <laughs> right, but they really wanted to demystify it. They really wanted to get down to, how do I get my job done every day? Yeah, and, and they, ha they had demystified it. And I think that's really the point, right? Mm -hmm. Is that when, hopefully that you saw people solving, other admins solving the same kind of problems that are, well, not exactly the same, but uh -huh. slightly different versions of the same problems that you've been solving for a really long time, maybe with different nomenclature added on top of it. And then the other thing was that they are, in most cases, what, a year, year or two, two right. out away from having been doing traditional on-prem monitoring or maybe hybrid IT with a little bit more, mm -hmm. but that these tools were, to your point, demystified. It didn't right. seem to be that different once they kind of grokked it and said, oh, I get it now. These, right. I'm going to reconcile errors with log messages. Ah, this is useful. And it's just the work of the work. It's just the regular work that I did, maybe with slightly different tools, maybe with slightly different mental concepts, but that's it. And that's what I want to do now that you're back. I want to just talk about how you get work done every day. So that's what we're going to do. I'm going to be the decoder ring. Uh -huh. You're going to talk about the work that they've been doing for a really long time yeah. well, and then I will occasionally remind them of when we see things that we heard people in Las Vegas talking about it from a dev perspective yeah. or an observability perspective and how it actually maps to the things that they're doing and that this really is the tools that they've been using for a long time are a jumping off place right. that a lot of people eventually go to when you get dragged there by the technology decisions that your companies are making. Right. So I want to start off with containers. Now we did If not, there's anything that's DevOpsy, it's got to it, be containers. It's got to be containers, but it's still again the work, the things that you do are still is still the normal work and the things that you know how to do, that mental process is still the mental process. So we did an episode uh, on SolarWinds Lab not too long ago about containers. I'm not going to define containers because you in your daily work you don't define containers. You don't walk around the cube saying, "Well, a container is an ephemeral object." No, no, no. I just want to know how to do. And I'm starting with App stack, yes, app stack. So I want to start by reminding everyone that in Black Camp 2018, uh, we were able to show people that uh, containers are included in SAM. It's right there, mm -hmm. and I'm looking at app stack, and there it is. Look at that. It's a layer right there. Uh, Amazing uh, that, a con that a container could actually be something that sits on top of a resource queue along with everything else that you're used to looking at, maybe if you're familiar with virtualization, that it should be considered the same way. Well, not only that, but when I click on this, and, and we understand how AppStack works, right? That's not something new. But what I want to show is that by focusing, uh, putting the focus on containers, that look, there's, there's still a host associated with it. Mm -hmm. There's still data stores. There's still volumes. There's still, these things called containers are not magical unicorn farts, okay? They really are just things. They might be slightly different, although for those of us who've been around a while, I might call them an LPAR but just because they look a lot fam very familiar to me, but okay. So that's the first point I want to make. The second thing I want to do is take a look at what you can see with this. So let's look at the details for that container, okay? okay? 
So there we are, and here we can see that there is some statistics here. I'm looking at the last 24 hours. What's happening here? We actually don't care because it's SolarWinds Lab. We're doing a demo. That's not the point. The point is, is that when you're getting work done, you have the metrics at your fingertips. You also have the mini stack view that shows you that this container is not a magical unicorn, unicorn fart in the sky. It actually exists within the same context of all the other things. But the difference here is that when we're looking at this in app optics, the container monitoring in app optics, that was a combination of infrastructure monitoring provided by an agent, yeah. right? Along with uh, tracing data that was actually being used to consolidate the various horizontally scaled components of that application into one overall view of that application. But in this case, you're taking what is normally the app stack data that's coming from the association of different modules polling data. Right. And what, in the case of almost like uh, Virtualization Manager, would be using what uh, API monitoring um, against uh, vCenter, right, to ask it about the VMs that were running within the purview of vCenter. Yeah. In this case, you're talking. Uh, Sam is talking to the orchestrator mm -hmm. for Mesos, uh, Docker, or Kubernetes, uh, Docker Swarm, or Kubernetes, mm -hmm. and getting that same information. So it's a slightly different architectural approach, and this synthesis of how we know what the components of that application are, that's a little bit of a different um, uh, technology to assemble them, but the view ends up being very, very similar. Right, and I'm going to stand over here on this side of the desk and say, don't care. Really, and like it's a very again DevOps regular ops ops. You know the fact is is that you're right. We're getting this information a different way, and we're going to look at that in a little bit. But the fact is is that it's my day to day job. I don't care where it's coming from. I know I can get the data. I know I can get my work done. That's the point. And even more so that there's a server associated. Okay, there's this lab knock center Kano one, right? And I want to take a look at that server. I want to see what that device is doing. Whatever that thing is. So there I am, I'm looking at it. If I scroll down, there's the containers right here. They're the ones that are part of my environment. If you don't want to say infrastructure because there's negative connotations to the infrastructure, it means routers and switches, whatever. I don't care. I'm not going to be pedantic about it. But these things, containers, are part of my world that I have to care about from that OpsyDev side of the world. But that's not all, okay. because we were, we've been laughing about alerts and things like that. But I want to show you that, again, because this is part of the integrated system, here I am building a new alert. And I think a lot of us traditional folks who came from regular knock-based monitoring are thinking, oh, containers, well, how am I supposed to do anything with them? Well, I've shown you that we can get the data. You can get the data where you want it, but what about the alerting? Well. If it's there, it's there. So normally you think about things like nodes, but if I scroll down here, there are containers. Mm -hmm. Containers are an object. They're You're collecting first class object. Yeah, exactly. And if I want to see what fields or what elements, I'm going to browse all. I'm not even going to play around with it. So there, I can look at things like um, the health, and I can look the health status, and I can look at the restart count. How many times has this container bounced? Maybe a lot, maybe none, who knows? And whether that matters or not isn't for us to define here today on SolarWinds Lab. It's for you to know that you're able to get that information and it can be made relevant in the context of everything else that's going on, whether it's an application aspect or uh, an infrastructure aspect or whatever it is, that the, the restart count may be one of those causal factors you want to consider or the state or the status. Okay, but that brings up the point of thinking again in terms of areas of the business or including the business in the conversation in a way yes. that you might not. Like what's the number one complaint a lot of times for our customers when they go to cloud is? Too expensive! I'm spending so much money, it was supposed to be cheaper. Yeah, it was supposed to be cheaper. <laughs> okay, well the first the first symptom of that would be, am I just doing lift and shift? Did right. I take what used to be a VM and I pushed it into a container and now I've been running that container for a year? Right, exactly. Right. So if I want to use my time created mm -hmm. and do a quick report and say, wow, you know, 75% of my container has been running for a more than a month. And the team said we were going to do this horizontally distributed uh, demand-based provisioning. We're not doing that. Yeah, reports your CIO might actually want. Right, so again, out that's, of monitoring. but that's a business metric effect, uh -huh. right? Like how long am I actually using this if my business goal is to move to a right. dynamically provisioned resource model and I am not doing that, I can measure the effectiveness of my business approach and how te the technology and the decisions that I'm making about the approach actually fit with that. Yes, and that is, again, the business, you're thinking as a monitoring engineer, you're thinking about the needs of the business and you're instrumenting and you're monitoring that. Okay, so one more thing I want to show. So here. I I'm back at the server, okay. and I'm going to go to Performance Analyzer. It's one of my favorite little quick, quick hits, quick links. 
and we're opening up a uh, perf stack view, Love which is, is delightful, but once again, container. Mm -hmm. And if I want to take that container that I've been talking about and I want to see what statistics can I get, well, I have you know, status and events, and I have statistics, what can I do? Well, let me just you know, throw, just, just for fun, the CPU and the memory right there. And now I'm able to, once again, combine the thing about, that is in my environment called containers, which is a new thing, but it's not an alien thing. And I can look at it across all the other elements, whether it's part of this server or part of other parts of the infrastructure, to see how they're interacting. Ah, well, let me show you how to set up the uh, app optics agent on that environment if you were going to monitor it using app optics. Okay, the mouse, she is yours. Awesome. All right. So remember before we saw this uh, when we were at AWS, I'm going to click on the infrastructure link here, and I, I've just got two uh, VMs that are being monitored here, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to add another one. Well, how do I do that? I'm going to come back here to home. I'm going to click on add host, and this is going to look awfully familiar. All right. So I am using your favorite. Yay, Ubuntu. Exactly. Yay. And so I click on Ubuntu, and it's going to give me the, uh, the command that I'm going to use. I'm just mm -hmm. going to copy that to my clipboard, and then come down here, and we need to actually switch over and connect to an instance. And for this, let's, shall Look we? Look at that, solar putty. Exactly. So I'm going to log into this system. This is running in uh, AWS. I'm going to paste this in because I'm just going to right click, of course. There's, mm -hmm. there's no con paste. Middle click, double click. No, we're not going to be, we don't judge. Do I want to install the App Optics agent? Well, yes, I do. We'll do a little time compression uh -huh. and, we're, and we're done, right? The magic of time compression. So, right here, it's telling us where it should appear, it's telling us what the host name is going to be, and that it succeeded. And now, if I come back over here to my App Optics portal, let's see, done. Look at that. It's a, oh, it's on my host list. That's pretty easy, right? It's going to take it a minute before we start getting metrics. Sure. But I've gone ahead and added that, and I can actually get my details from that system, uh -huh. and it will start sending me data right away. If this was a part of a container environment, it would also ask, hey, do you want to start monitoring containers in this environment? And then the agent would take care of adding additional monitoring to be able to pull container metrics as well. All right, Leon, in all of that, are you sure that you're not just a little bit making my case that expanding your view, being a little bit broader about what you intend to actually monitor, the data that you're looking for is at least a toe into the water of the observability pool? Okay, re not really. What I'm just trying to remind folks is that if they keep in mind the needs of the business and let that drive what and how they monitor, instead of monitoring all the things and flinging alerts everywhere, that the Business is going to like them more. Well, they are going to like them more, and they're probably going to let you, I don't know, be a little bit more aggressive about, oh, I don't know, culture change. And so if you are changing your culture to start mm -hmm. thinking outside of the box okay. about where you can actually get data, about data that you would actually juxtapose, for example, data that the business cares about, data that shows that customers are happy, along with infrastructure, if you get people excited about culture change, then why not take the step and really think about DevOps in the way that you see, about, see it written about, that you see books about it, about adopting a lot of the practices of DevOps and really inviting, truly inviting developers into operation. Okay, so, but what did we hear about people from Vegas? What did they think? Well, the Vegas say that there's a lot of tools and approaches out there. Uh, certainly, it's interesting that they dehype them at, at least as much as we do. Um, and then your demos showed that what they were talking about really do apply regardless of the types of tools that we're using. I mean, there's some demarcations and there's some divisions about the specifics mm -hmm. about whether something is a container or it's a microservice, whether it's something that you would manage in app optics or you would be able to do it in uh, SAM directly. But they look they sound like the same kinds of problems, just with a little bit different nomenclature uh, from the audience that's actually using them. Right. I also showed real live tracing in Orion. I showed log aggregation on-prem, and by cutting down on alerts, you did that by thinking about events differently. I just didn't pour the magical rainbow DevOps sauce on it. I feel like you're making fun of me. No, never. Okay, well, fine, and we'll wrap this up. We hope that this slightly unusual format for Lab was really helpful, and we want your feedback as always, because the 
truth is that the moving parts of hybrid IT, including but not limited to DevOps and observability, is somewhere between all in and mm -mm, no, we're not going to ever, right? And we, as usual in technology, are stuck right in the middle. But that's a point. We're always stuck in the middle. IT is always stuck in the middle. We're the ones who have to figure out if, not if an app can be built or if it's going to be cool in the first six months. We have to figure out how to keep apps running for years. You, the members of THWAC, are the audience that Amazon, Microsoft, and Google, and everybody else are talking to. And your comments are really helpful. That's absolutely right. And so if you're not with us live, and of course, how do we know, how do they know if they're with us live? Because there's that chatty box over there. That's right. And you're talking to us live, and we're talking about who knows what. Uh -huh. If you don't see that box, well then, swing by our homepage, which is lab.solarwinds.com. Check out past episodes, but most of all, check on the schedule for upcoming episodes and be with us live next time. Okay, so that's it, right? We had AWS attendee goodness, containers, and microservices, and tracing. Oh my, and all of that in Orion. And we untangled, hopefully, hopefully, the DevOps at least a bit and where SolarWinds is in terms of DevOps tools. That actually feels like an awful lot. And we're sorry that you didn't get to go to AWS. It is an awful lot, and I am not sorry that I missed AWS. Really? Really, how do your feet feel? They're still pretty numb. Uh, exactly. Okay, so for SolarWinds Lab, I'm Liana Dotto. And I'm Patrick Hubbard. Keep your feedback coming, and we'll see you next time.